Good morning. Welcome to Grace Life Church. Glad each of you here this morning. And we're going to have a big time in Jesus this morning. We want to invite uh, and say thank you to all the people who's joined us by whichever way you Facebook, Twitter face, Insta, Instagram face, however you want to do it. Just joking with you, but uh, uh, in our YouTube channel. So we're glad that you're here with us this morning. We have some very special guests with us, Pastor Randy and Mary Green. If you're in the Gadsden area or anywhere around Etowah County, or if you know people there, uh, you need to uh, let us know or let them know. Uh, they pastor Restoration Church uh, in Southside in the, in the Gaston area, and they would be thrilled to be able to meet you. But they're here with us this morning. You can't have them there with us. So, so we, 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 we're doing what you, the Bible says don't do. We're coveting this morning. So we coveted and got them here. And so they're going to come share with us. So uh, let's give them a big hand as they come this morning and minister the Word of God. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Bless the Lord. Isn't he wonderful? Yes. Will you just thank God for his glory here today? The, de the glory has been declared in this place. Amen. Amen. And we are so glad to be with you. When I told the guys last night, when I, when I practice my sermons, I, believe, I, I, I pretend I'm standing right here <laughs> looking at y'all. I do this all the time. I imagine being here. I'm only standing here because I've imagined it. All these times, and now I'm standing here, give, you know, saying these things. So I'm gonna let Miss Mary go first. It's really dangerous to let her go first. I don't like to follow her, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take a chance this time. It's, a, but we're we're so excited to be here, and thank y'all so much. And yes. we, uh, our, the Wests are, uh, they are they're just dear to us. We we love them and their family, and you're their family. So we uh, we love you. Amen. Amen. Praise Consider you part of our family, just an extension of our own. Thank you, Jesus. How many of you know that there's more? Amen. There's more. And we sang about that this morning, so I was excited about that. Well, the Lord has been talking to me about something for uh, several months now, and I'm excited to get to share some things with you today about, uh, you know, there's a, a shift going on in the world. I think we can all agree that things are shifting around and there's a lot of noise out there. But we are uh, kingdom dwellers and the Lord wants us to live in victory and live above all the chaos and the storm. So I want to talk to you today a little bit about how to do that. And um, I want to start in Genesis. I want to talk about Abraham for just a, a few minutes. Um, it's time to, to be untangled. God, it, the, the time that we're in is a time of untangling us from mammon's grasp, from the world system. God is breaking us loose. So he's showing us some wonderful things about who we are in the process. Sometimes it feels a little shaky, but if we hold on and we stay in faith, because, and it's about trust. How do we have victory in Jesus? It's just, it is by trust. Absolute trust in his word. Because we know who he is. He's not a random person out here that might tell us a lie. That might not be completely honest with us. So we can trust God. When God tells you something, you can trust it. You know, he asked me something recently. He said, where is, where is your faith located? And I thought about that for a minute. I thought, well... Well, I, you know, I'm, my faith is in you. He said, no, where is your faith located? I want to know if you trust me because I'm the one that said this to you or if you're trusting in your ability to carry out and to perform what I've told you that I've already done. I said, well, I think I better just trust in you and take my hands off of it and step back. So it really showed me something. It showed me my father is not a random person out here that just tells me they're going to do something or that they have done something for me. He did something for me. Jesus came and died and spent his life, poured it out for me, and then gave me the benefit of if I had lived just like him. So he said, trust me. 
Trust me because my word never returns void. So if God's word never returns void, it never comes back empty. It never comes back not having done what God said it would do. And if he has given us a word through, through this scripture, through a word from him personally, then you can be guaranteed that it will, it will happen. It will come to pass in your lifetime, in the land of the living, in what we call this earth, this world right here. So thank you, Jesus, for that word that you've given us. Let's go to Genesis chapter 16. Now I'm going to preface this, and you all know this. Abraham, Abraham he's been called out to leave his family, leave his home, and take Sarah, his wife. And we know at the time, they're not Abraham and Sarah. They're Abram and Sarai. So they're on, they're, <clears throat> they've come out. They have obeyed. They're out, and they're following, trying. They're after what, the prom what God promised them. Well, here in, verse, in, in chapter 16, they run into a little snag. You know, somewhere along the way, God promises Abram, you're going to have offspring. Well, we know how up until this point, that has not happened. In uh, chapter 16, verse 1, it says, Now Sarai, Abram's wife, had borne him no children, and she had an Egyptian maidservant whose name was Hagar. So, Sarah, so Sarai says to Abram, See now the Lord, now this is important, See now, the Lord has restrained me from bearing children. Please go into my maid. Perhaps I shall obtain children by her. The, so we see in this moment her view of God, how, what she believes about God. He has restrained me. So hold on to that. So we go down. We see um, now when, when Abram left, he was 75. Well, at this point, he's 85 because we, we find out in verse 15 that he has a son with Hagar and he's 86 years old. So a lot of time went by here. And a lot of time, you know, we read over this sometimes and we skip over, well, well, you know, she just had a brilliant idea to go give her maid to and made all kinds of mess out of this. But we really need to just stop and, and look at her for just a moment. She believes something about the Lord. She believes that he's restrained her. Can you see just for a moment the pressure that she might be under having gone 10 years now, still no children? Do you think perhaps she might feel like it might, it, it might be her fault? So you see this pressure on her. So she's pressured to make the promise come true. So in her own strength, her own ability, whatever she can come up with in her natural mind, she puts together this plan. She's not evil, except for the part about the Lord saying um, the Israelites had an evil heart of unbelief. But she's not, do, she's not um, malicious. She's not evil. She really does want to see the plan of God. What do you think it, it probably affected her to see the disappointment maybe in her husband year after year. So those kind of things affect us. We don't, we look at this word sometimes and we read it and we go over things just a little bit too quick, quickly. They had lives and they felt things. They had emotions, they had a will, they had a mind just like we do. They went through things. And so we see her, she's struggling with this. She goes on, well, so they've got, they have a son. Hagar and Abram have a son. And then 13 years go by. 13 years, and there's no record of God speaking to Abram for 13 years. So sometimes when, when we run ahead and we help God out, and I know maybe you've never done that, but I have done that a time or two in my life, and it causes delays. It ultimately causes a delay. So now, 13 years have gone by. Let's, sit, let's pick up here and see, see what happens. After 13 years, you gotta, you, you gotta know something has gone on in their mind, something. Well, I'm gonna skip down here and in uh, chapter 17, 
God comes to uh, Abraham. When Abraham's 99 years old, in verse 1, the Lord appeared to Abram and said to him, I am Almighty God. Walk before me and be blameless. And I will make my covenant between me and you and will multiply you exceedingly. Then Abram fell on his face and talked with God. And God talked with him. And then... Um, let me skip over here. I want to get to verse 15 because that's where I'm going. So he tells Abram, I'm going to make you a father of nations. He says, I'm going to give you an offspring. And he says in verse 15, this is right after he has told Abram, you are now going to be Abraham. I'm calling you Abraham. Verse 15, he says, then God says to Abraham as for Sarai, your wife, you shall not call her name Sarai, but Sarah shall her name be. And I will bless her and also give you a son by her. Then I will bless her and she shall be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Abraham fell on his face and laughed. Well, he said in his heart, shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old and shall Sarah, who is 19 years old, bear a child? And Abraham said to God, oh, that Ishmael might live before you. See, Abraham couldn't wrap his natural mind around what God had just said. It's too big. It's bigger than Abraham. He's 99 now. Then God said, no, Sarah, your wife, shall bear you a son, and you shall call his name Isaac and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant. So this is the promise that comes through. Now we've changed our name, and what is significant about God changing their name is what did he do? What did he do to Abram and Sarai? He inserted a letter, which is when in, in the English language, we look at that and it's an H. He adds an H to Sarah and Abraham. But that letter, is it represents God. It is part of the name Yahweh. Did you know that Yahweh, the um, numeric number for the word Yahweh is 10565? Five. That's the, the value of God's name. And did you know that you, in your DNA, you have every 10, every five, every six, every five strands of DNA, you have a sulfur bridge. So in your DNA is written Yahweh. That H represents the breath of God. So God put his breath in them. He put his grace. It also represents his grace. So he added grace, his breath, his ability, his force to Abraham and Sarah. That changed them. That changed them, and you know it changed them on a molecular level, on a natural, physical level, because they produce an heir. Yes. So we know that happens. So how much more are we, are we here when we understand that God has put his name on us, signed our DNA with his name, his breath? So we're going, well, let me continue here. We get through to, I'm going to go to verse chapter 18. And this is where they see the Lord from afar off, and he comes to their tent. And so Abraham has Sarah, you know, quickly make some, uh, make some cakes for them. And in um, verse 9, then they said to him, where is Sarah your wife? And he said, here in the tent. He said, I will certainly return to you according to the time of life. And behold, Sarah, your wife, shall have a son. Sarah was listening in the tent door and was behind him. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, very advanced in age, and Sarah had passed the age of childbearing. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I've grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord, being so old? And then the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Surely I shall, not, shall bear a child since I'm old. Is anything too hard for the Lord? See, this is the Lord's word. Is anything too hard for the Lord? No. Nothing's too hard for the Lord. So we see, and if we keep reading, we know, we keep, we keep going the next, uh, next few verses. We find out she does have a son in the next, um, the next year. She has this son. But what happens, um, what happens to her? 
between the time she said, the Lord has restrained me, to now. In chapter 21, it says, And the Lord visited Sarah, as he had said, and the Lord did for Sarah as he had spoken. For Sarah conceived and bore Abraham a son in his old age, at the set time of which God had spoken with him. So God did what he said. What did she have to do with it? Nothing. She didn't have anything to do with her body changing, her coming from death to life in her womb. God did that for them. I want to turn over to Hebrews. I want to read one scripture because you really can't tell right here what changed in her mind. But if you go over to, Ab to Hebrews chapter 11, you can. You can, uh, you can see exactly where her mind changed. And it is in um, Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 11. By faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, and she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. So now we see, wait a minute, over here she said, God's restrained me. He's holding me back. Well, now, after these years go by, you see a change in her. She judged him faithful who had promised. So we see there's a, there's a mind change. So what happened? Well, a maturing process took place. And what the maturing process for us, sometimes, sometimes we don't want to go through it because it's a little shaky on our flesh. It is. But... The purpose of it is to get us to trust God, to put our absolute trust in Him. That's what it's about. And sometimes that feels uh, a little unstable when we have all of these ideas of how we want to do things. But God, is, God knows exactly what we need. He built us, put us together, designed us, made us for a purpose. Did you know He put a roar in you? There's a roar in you. Some of us, we don't even know that, that, um, that there's something like that in us. But Holy Spirit is in us. If you're born again, then Holy Spirit dwells inside of you. And there is a roar. And that roar is for such a time as this. It's for this day that we live in. Now, the purpose of me sharing that about Abraham and Sarah is to show you what God does when he puts himself in you. The power and anointing comes on you to do the impossible. It doesn't matter what the world says. It doesn't matter what the system says. The system says this can't be done. It's never been done. Who do you think you are? Well, I'm the one that Holy Spirit lives in. I'm the one. Wait a minute. I'm the offspring of God Almighty. Ooh. We're not supposed to say things like that. <laughs> well, that's a spirit too, and it's called religion. Uh -oh. no. So we had. So what we we're what we're seeing in this time of shifting is the enemy is being exposed. Mm -hmm. The enemy is being disrobed because and and why is that? Because he's parading around in a false facade of your anointing of your authority, what belongs to you. He's trying to wear it as if it's his, but it's not. And so in this day and hour that we live in, God is exposing that and he's stripping him bare of that. So what will happen at the end of this, if you are willing to go through God's maturing process, there, because there's no shortcut for it. What hap we saw what happened in Abraham and Sarah. The shortcut delayed them. So there's not a shortcut for maturing, but there is, with the Holy Spirit, there is a bypass around all the noise of the enemy. So even though there's not a shortcut for you, because we have to come to the place where we say, God, none of me and all of you, I surrender, I yield to your way. And when we do that, we're humble. What does the Bible say about the humble? God lifts them up. God's waiting for that because in that moment, he knows that he can give you all of him. That's what he's waiting for. He says, if you'll give me all of you, then I'll give you all of me. 
But sometimes we're so filled with our way of doing things that we don't realize that that's taking up space. It's taking up space in our mind, in our thinking, in our lives. And so God's coming to, it's come to this. He wants all of you so that he can give you all and so that he can make your life completely victorious from glory to glory to glory. That's how we're supposed to be living in this shifty time where the world is screaming and shaking and the enemy looks big and bad and ugly. But the truth is the roar is in you, not him. That's why he's shaking. That's why it's so noisy. He knows where the roar is and he's terrified because you're going to discover it. So fear is afraid. The spirit of fear is very afraid right now because of who you're becoming. You're becoming who you really are. Let's go to uh, Esther. And sometimes, you know, religion, religion is um, the spirit. I'm talking about a spirit of religion. It just, uh, it wants to put you in a box. It's always telling you what you can't do. And mammon is always on the other side telling you how you're gonna have to do. And so just the noise, the back and forth between them, and then you have another spirit over here in the world, and we, we see it, Jezebel is loud and roaring right now out in the world. And that's just a spirit that just wants to control you. That's all that is. So we see these, this, these three spirits working. Not, and I won't say they work together, but they work at the same time. They're not in agreement with each other. Certainly not. But they do work at the same time. And then they use the, you know, they, they'll use shame and guilt, regret, they use all of these things on us. On, and sometimes you can be walking in shame and you don't even know it. Anything that, make, that you think of, that you remember, that makes you feel bad, that's the spirit of shame right there. Because the goodness of God leads us to repentance. Remember? It's the goodness of God. It's not you are, you've done this and this and this. Who do you think you are? You're just terrible. But God said, well, turn around, look behind you. There's nothing there. There's this. This is all that's behind us. There is no past. We're free. We are free. Okay, let's go to Esther. Most of us are familiar with the story. We know that um, the king, uh, for sake of time, he gets mad at the queen. She's out. He gets him a new one. So they gather up all the virgins in the land, and he's going to pick him a new queen. Well, Hadassah is a, she's a little Jewish girl. And she gets selected as one of these to go. She's being raised by um, her cousin, Mordecai. This, this is chapter two. I'm going to start in verse seven. And Mordecai had brought up Hadassah, that is Esther, his uncle's daughter. And she had neither father nor mother. So we see she was an orphan and her cousin took her to raise. The young woman was lovely and beautiful. When her father and mother died, Mordecai took her as his own daughter. So in um, verse 8, so it was when the king's command and decree were heard that when many young women were gathered at Shushan, the citadel, under the, custo the custody of Haggai, that Esther also was taken to the king's palace into, a care, into the care of Haggai, the custodian of the women. Now the young woman pleased him, and she obtained, she obtained his favor, so he readily gave beauty preparations to her besides her allowance. See, when you get on the path that God has for you, your provision is already there set up for us. Yep. That's why we can trust him, because he's, he has gone from our life beginning to the end. Remember, he sees the end from the beginning. So then he comes back. Work is finished. Do you know the work on you is finished? God's already done it. Well, now he has come back, and now he's taking your hand, and he's going to walk you through the victory of who you are in your life. So he doesn't get torn up over every little mistake we make. Now, religion does. The spirit of religion will hammer you. 
for every mistake, not God. Because when he looks at you, he sees the finished work. He sees who you are. He doesn't see what's in, what you're thinking in your natural mind right now or the mistake you made yesterday or you said this and you shouldn't have done this. Maybe He doesn't see that. He sees, ah, my beloved, my masterpiece. Yeah. Do you know what the mystery of the universe is? It's you. You, you know, I was walking and talking with the Lord recently. And I said, Lord, you are the most wonderful mystery that I love to find out, to dig into every day. The best mystery in this whole universe is you, Father. He said, no, it's you. He said, you're the mystery of this universe. You're the mystery that all of creation is crying out and they're, it's like they're lunging forward and they're in ex great expectation for the sons of God to manifest. That's what the word says. Well, that's who we are. We are the offspring of God and the creation. This earth itself is leaned in waiting for your debut. So there's a roar in you. But the enemy doesn't want us to know it. The enemy wants us to turn around and look at everything out there and be distracted by every, every voice, everything on the television, everything in the news. And there are some bad things out there right now. There are. But they, they're not shaking our Father God. The enemy's what's shaking. So we, if, we are, if we are in Christ and we stay in him, then we are on solid ground and we get to rise above the storm and the chaos and live in the high places with Jesus. Let's go on here. So we see she has gotten on this path. It's ordained by God. She might not understand it. She might not qualify for it. She's little Hadassah, little Jewish girl, insignificant orphan. But yet she has been provided for to, to an extent that it says here, that he gave her beauty preparations besides her allowance. Then seven choice maidservants were provided for her from the king's palace. And he moved her to her maidservants and to, to them, he moved them to the best place in the house. So something's going on supernatural here for her because she's insignificant. She's being provided for. Now, in verse 10, it says, Esther has not revealed her people or her family, for Mordecai had charged her not to reveal it. So now we see, we're going to see a, a little bit similar si uh, situation here. We've got Hadassah and we have Esther. We had Sarai and Sarah. You know, Sarai tried for 24 years to be a mother. She never succeeded at that. But the moment she put on Sarah, she became pregnant with expectation and she birthed the Jewish nation. That was because Sarai had to be consumed by Sarah. That's the maturing process that sometimes we don't wanna go through sometimes. Our old self, who we think we are, in, in my case, the Lord used a word called princess and it was not a good word. It was not, but he said, this is what the little princess does. See, she wants everything just this way, and she wants it this way. Everything's got to be right. She cares too much what everybody thinks. But I didn't call you to be a princess. So you have to stand up in the office and in the, the assignment that I called you to, and that means you might have to do things or say things that are uncomfortable to the princess. So which one do you want to be? So then I have to make a choice. It's called growing up and stepping over and into the assignment. It doesn't feel good. It's not comfortable to this flesh. But in the midst of that, do you know, I discovered there was a roar inside me. And I had to stand up. And in this case, I stood up and said, God, you know, I, I can't stand up in my strength because I don't have any. But I am standing up in your strength right now. I was so sick at this moment, but I did. I stood up, and a lot of things were going wrong, but I stood up because I believed that if I was in Christ, then he was in me, then I could stand up in his strength because he said that I could do all things through his strength. So I took him at his word. I just trusted him, and I stood up, and something in me snapped. 
I cannot describe it any other way, but something snapped. And I turned around and I looked at this thing that just kept hounding me, hounding me. And I just leaned in and I said, you better run. <laughs> and I meant it. And I'm thinking, God, did that just come out of me? <laughs> I, there was such a holy, righteous indignation that rose up in me. And that thing, for the first time I saw, I see you who you are. I'm the one with the authority, not you. And the Lord said, that's it. You just disrobed the enemy. And now you're standing with the authority that was yours all along. And I can tell you the, um, the, what I was dealing with in that moment it was a physical issue. It was gone, just like that. And I knew, I, whoa, this is something new, Lord. He said, this is how you walk in victory. This is my offspring. This is a picture of who you are when you're willing to lay down your own way and your own childish thinking. And that's a hard one. Gosh, we just don't want to hear that. That's not pretty words. He said, no, that's what the princess likes, pretty words. She wants to preach from a pretty little pulpit. And life is not that way. Sometimes life is messy. So he said, put away, and this is, I'm going to just quote this. This is 1 Corinthians 13, 11, if you want to write it down. That's where Paul has to put away childish things. He said, when I was a child, I spoke like a child. He said, but when I became a man, I had to put away childish things. That's what happened to Sarah. She had to put away the childishness, the being offended at God because he's restrained her. She had to put that away and become the mother of the Jewish nation. That was always in her. She just didn't know it until a roar came out of her. And that changed everything in a moment. Esther's the same way. Let's continue. Now in verse 15, now we see she goes through this uh, year process of being prepared. Now in verse 15, now it's her turn, came for Esther, the daughter of Abihel, the, the uncle of Mordecai, who had taken her as his daughter to go into the king. She requested nothing but what Haggai, the king, the king's eunuch, the custodian of the women advised. I think that's interesting that she didn't, that she just yielded. She's gone through a year of training and now she goes in to the, to the man she trusts, the one that takes care of her, that provides for her. It's like a picture of the father. So that's who she goes, what should I, what should I do? And a Apparently, he tells her something, and that's what she does. She obtains favor in the sight of all who saw her. So even, even that is miraculous. You get a bunch of girls together, and you set one up a little higher than the other ones, there's going to be a fight. <laughs> but apparently, there's not, because it says she obtained favor in the sight of all who saw her. I mean, any girl in here knows that's miraculous. So Esther was taken to King Ahasuerus into the royal palace in the 10th month, which is the month of Tibet, in the seventh year of his reign. The king loved Esther more than all the other women, and she obtained grace and favor in his sight more than all the virgins. So he set the royal crown upon her head and made her queen. So she becomes the queen at this point. So what happens? Well... This is in the seventh year. Let's skip over to the twelfth year. So she's been queen about five years now. And Mordecai hears of a plot against the king. And so he goes, he's very upset about it. In chapter four, it says, when he learns all that has happened about the, the plot, he tore his clothes and put on sackcloth and ashes and went out into the midst of the city and he cried out with a loud and bitter cry. He went as far as the front of the king's gates for no one might enter the king's gate clothed in sackcloth. And in every province where the king's command and decree arrived, there was a great mourning among the Jews with fasting, weeping, and wailing. Because we know Haman, that was second in command, has devised this plot to get rid of the Jewish nation. So they're mourning. Well, Esther's maids in verse 4, and the eunuchs came and told her, and the queen was deeply distressed. So here's what she, her, in her mind, she's, okay, 
I'm going to send him some clothes. Clean him up, for heaven's sake. Clean him up. He's a mess. This is what she thinks that he ought to do. She sends the garments to clothe Mordecai and take a sackcloth away from him, but he would not accept them. Then Esther called Hattat, one of her king's eunuchs, whom he had appointed at the that attended her, and he gave him a command concerning Mordecai to learn what was what and why this was. So he went out to Mordecai in the city square that was in front of the king's gate, and Mordecai told him all that had happened and the sum of the money that Haman had promised to pay into the king's treasuries to destroy the Jews. He also gave him a copy of the written decree for their destruction, which was given at Shushan. So this looks like a done deal. This is, I mean, it, it, it's in writing. There's money been exchanged for this. So in the natural, it looks like there's no way out. So he takes it and he shows it to Esther and explains it to her and that he might command her to go into the king to make supplication for him and plead before him for her people. So he returns and tells Esther the words of Mordecai. Then Esther spoke. And he gave him the command for Mordecai. All the king's servants and all the people of the king's province know that any man or woman who goes into the inner court of the king who has not been called, he has but one law, put all to death, except the one to whom the king holds out the golden scepter, that he may live. Yet I myself have not been called to go to the king these 30 days. So they told Mordecai Esther's words. So Esther is... Now, she's been queen five years, but she hasn't seen the king in a month, and she knows the law. This is death if I just prance in there and show myself. So she's saying, I can't do this. Verse 13, Mordecai told them to answer Esther, Do not think in your heart that you will escape in the king's palace any more than all the other Jews. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place. But you and your father's house will perish. Do you see how sure God's word is? Relief will arise from some other place. Well, I, you know, if, for me, it was like this. God said, I've called you to do something for me. I've given you an assignment. The assignment's going to be carried out, but it's your choice if it's done by you. So that, kind of, that, that carried some weight with me. I said, Lord, I believe I will be the one. You, you I, he, present here, I say yes. So then Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. Well, let me back up here, verse 14. For if you remain completely silent at this time, relief and deliverance will arise for the Jews from another place, but you and your father's house will perish. Yet who knows whether you have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. I'm telling you, we are living in a moment of such a time as this. You are here for such a time as, as this. And there is an assignment on your life. It doesn't matter if it is in the five-fold ministry or if it is out there, there is still an assignment. You still are called to be ministers of reconciliation. We are part of one kingdom. We're part of God's kingdom. And what's happening right now is the kingdoms of this world are becoming the kingdoms of our Lord and Christ. We're in the shaking of that coming to pass. And so there's assignment laid out for us. And so we have to, but, we, but there's a way to walk it out in victory, fully provided for, because our God is a good God. He doesn't leave, he doesn't leave us half of our needs supplied. He is a all the way. He wants all of us, and he'll give us all of him. So in verse 15, we see Esther told them to reply to Mordecai. So this gets her attention. Go gather all the Jews who are present in Shushan and fast for me. Neither eat nor drink three days and night. My maids and I will fast likewise. And so I will go to the king, which is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. Uh-oh. We see a roar coming out. <laughs> She's getting some boldness on her. So she goes. She fasts. Chapter 5. Now it happened on the third day 
that Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the king's palace. See, she had to put something on. She put on her royal robes. Well, that's what we have to do. We have to put on our royal robes as the offspring of the king of kings. God Almighty our, is our father. So sometimes we have to stand in our own mirror and stir ourselves up. Remember David? David didn't have anybody to stir him up and things were looking pretty bad at the moment. But he stepped up and stirred himself up. That's the point of maturity kicking in. And sometimes we just want to lay down and we want to whine. Because it feels better. But this is not the day for that anymore. God says there's a roar in you. Stand up. And when you stand up, you're going to stand up in my strength. And when you do that, I promise, something in you will shift too. And you'll stand back and say, oh, did I just say that? Did I just do that? And then the next thing you're going to see is the backside of the enemy running in terror away from you. He doesn't want you to put on your royal robes. So Esther puts on her royal robes and she stood in the inner court of the king's palace. And I'm going to skip down here in verse 2. So it was when the king saw Queen Esther standing in the court that she found favor in his sight and the king held out to Esther the golden scepter that was in his hand. Then Esther went near and touched the top of the scepter and the king said to her, what do you wish, Queen Esther? What is your request? It shall give, be given to you up to half the kingdom. Then Esther answered, if it pleases the king, let the king and Haman come today to the banquet that I have prepared for him. Then the king said, bring Haman quickly that he may do as Esther has said. Pay attention to this right here that Esther has said. So the king and Haman went to the banquet that Esther has prepared. At the banquet of wine, the king said to Esther, what is your petition? And it shall be granted to you. What is your request up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Esther answered and said, my petition and request is this. If I found favor in the sight of the king, and if it pleases the king to grant my petition and fulfill my request, then let the king and Haman come to the banquet which I will prepare for them, and tomorrow I will do as the king says. So we see Esther has waffled twice here. Now she stands up in this roar, and she goes to the king's court. And then when she's there to do, remember why she's there. She's there to tell on Haman. She does not do that. She says, uh, uh, come, come have dinner with me. So see, you see she's still, she's not exactly there yet in her confidence. So she invites them to dinner. And we see here at dinner, she's not there yet. She said, come back tomorrow. So let's skip over to chapter 7. But by the second, second, and this, here's a point I want to make here. There's always a do-over. There's always a do-over. God is not going to leave you. If you are crying out to God, if you are submitted to God, then guess what? There's always a do-over for you. You get to stand in front of the enemy and you get to win. Chapter 7, verse 1. So the king and Haman went to dine with Queen Esther. Now before, Esther made a meal. Esther went, Esther stood, and Esther was timid. But here they're going to dine with the queen. I just think that's interesting that that's the way this is worded. And on the second day at the banquet of wine, the king said, again, said to Esther, what is your petition, Queen Esther, and it shall be granted to you? And what is your request up to half the kingdom? It shall be done. Then Queen Esther answered and said, If I have found favor in your sight, O king, and if it pleases the king, let my life be given me at my petition and my people at my request. For we have been sold. If we had been sold, my people and I, to be destroyed and to be killed and to be annihilated, had we been sold as male and female slaves, I would have held my tongue, although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. What? This woman who was over here just, it seems like here moments ago, that man hasn't called me for a month. I can't show up in his court. And all of a sudden she says, if we had been sold as slaves, I wouldn't have said anything. Although the enemy could never compensate for the king's loss. 
Who was she talking about? She was talking about herself. Now she has come to an understanding of her value. The king will never be compensated for my loss. The enemy can never make amends for that. But I would have held my silence. So now we see the roar coming out of her. So King Ahasuerus answered and says to Queen Esther, Who is he and where is he who would dare presume in his heart to do such a thing? And we know what happens next. Esther says, the adversary and the enemy is this wicked Haman. Well, verse, skip over to verse 10. Let's just see what happens to Haman. They hanged Haman on the gallows that he had prepared for Mordecai. Then the king's wrath subsided. So when Esther, see, she has to come to an, an, an it's like she is arguing with herself. She's Hadassah. Hadassah wants to go and stand in front of the king. Hadassah wants to do the right thing, but Hadassah's not equipped, but Queen Esther is. So when she dons her royal robes and she goes forth, it doesn't exactly go like she plans, but God is merciful. His mercies are renewed for us every day. So she keeps going, and the next day, well, the next day when she stood there, she was standing in her queen's robes, and the roar came out of her and said, I know my value to the king. And then she gives up Haman. So she ends up with Haman's house. The king also took his signet ring off which he had taken from Haman, this is chapter eight, and gave it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed Mordecai over the house of Haman. So we see the result here. When you stand up in who you really are, because that's what it's about. You are the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. It doesn't matter what's behind you. It doesn't matter what you said yesterday. That's gone. What matters is, are you the offspring of God or not? Who's the head and not the tail? Who's above and not beneath? It's me, it's you. But the day we live in, the enemy is roaring so loud. But the Bible says he goes about roaring as a lion. Not that he is a lion, but like a lion. So that tells me he's parading as something he's not. And so we have to stand up and realize who we are in the moment. Whatever it is you're dealing with, it doesn't matter. God is our source. God is the one that lives in us. We are his offspring. Do we even have a revelation on the inside of who we are as a species? God Almighty created you. And he wrote his name in your DNA. And he put his Holy Spirit in you. And that roar, if you will submit to God and say yes to him and how we do that, how we yield to him is trust. That's how we overcome in this day. We overcome because we trust him. We say, God, I don't care. If I perish, I perish. I'm walking with you. And what happens is when you take that first step, when you step out, the ground becomes solid under your feet with every step, but it is a t the day we live in, we're having to step every day and trust God every day and defy the voices that come to us and say, this can't be done. It's not going to work. We're not going to make it. It's impossible. Well, God specializes in impossible. He says with all things, with God, all things are possible. So it's a, it's a mindset change and we can't, but we do it through our spirit. Where we get hung up is when we try to live it out naturally. We just have to let go and say, God, you do this through me. Let your light shine through me. Your, your spirit come forth. And then victory flows. Amen? Praise the Lord. It's time to untangle from mammon. And this is how we're going to do it. God's expo exposing the enemies in our life. He's exposing when I was sitting there during praise and worship, I heard this. It's time for you to be untangled from all the yokes and burdens that you've carried your life long. Stand up and look around because it will be as though they never existed. God is stepping in and God is going to perform for us because that's who he is. That's, he, he's our father. You as fathers, wouldn't you step in for your children? In a heartbeat you would, in a heartbeat. 
Well, God's saying that the fact that you even know to do that is from me. We wouldn't even know that love if it wasn't for God. He is love. Not He doesn't have love. He is love. And that love will come out of us in a force. And I'm telling you, you will not be the same. Your life will not be the same. Suddenlies, it's time for suddenlies in our lives. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, really good. Man, that's wonderful. Praise God. You don't have to go anywhere. Just turn around to I just want to share, to go along with what she's saying, uh, you know, she's, she talked about the enemy going about like a roaring lion. Jesus d didn't go about like anything. He went around as the lion. <laughs> he was the lion of Judah. The devil has to go around like a roaring lion. Jesus was that. So that's who lives in your life. And, and I simply uh, wanted to say that, uh, and I wrote this down, and God told me to tell you this. Jesus is not disappointed in you. He is not disappointed. If you think about that word disappoint or disappointment, you got that little first part, that dis. It, you know, they, kids used to say that some years ago. They don't, don't be dissing me, you know, and I, I just thought it was something made up. But they were just using that prefix there, dis, which means to nullify, do away with or zero out. So when you, when, when you are disappointed in yourself, you're dissing, zeroing out your appointment. You're zero in and out. So I came up, God told me one day, He said, I've never been disappointed in you. I said, you got to be kidding, Lord. <laughs> That's impossible. You had to. I know all the stuff I've done. I, I mean, I mean, back before I was born again, He said, no, I've never been disappointed. By the fact you made it to your appointment of being born again means I was never disappointed in you. And so He is not disappointed in you. Uh, he is, I heard this here a while back and it shocked me. God said, I'm not really tore up over sin. I'm like, no way. Just, just quit it, Lord. Just stop. <laughs> he said, no, I was. There was a time that I had a problem with it, but then I sent Jesus. So I'm not tore up over that anymore. And as Mary said, He sees us past all that. Uh, let's look at Hebrews. I just want to go to Hebrews chapter 12. Um, I had this experience the other day. I was riding by. We, we got a, a Buck, Buck's Boats is a uh, marina in Southside there. And everywhere we go in Southside, you go, you know, from our house to go into town, we go by Buck's Boats. So I like boats. And uh, I, want a, I want a boat. I have a particular boat that I want at some point so that I can go to the Gulf of Mexico, put it in, Troll, do things like that. It's just kind of a deal that I've looked at. Have done that before. But I was riding by the Buck's Boats, and I had a little time. But when I rode by, I said, you know what? I'm not going to stop. I'm just not going to stop and look. They're all along the road there. They're nice, pretty. I said, I'm just not going to stop. And the Lord said, why are you not going to stop? I said, well, I don't. I don't, one, I don't have time. And, and, and number two, we're building a house right now. You know I'm not going to buy a boat. He said, I know you're not. He said, that's not what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. He said, you're ashamed to stop. I'm like, what? He said, yeah. You're allowing shame to keep you from even looking at something. And he said, the point is not whether you're going to buy a boat or not. I got boats. <laughs> there are boats in the yard. There are boats. I have several. You know, two or three. But he said, it's not, I'm not that's not the point he was trying to make. He said, the point is you are ashamed to stop and even look at this because you've got so much other, th other stuff to do. And he said, what's happening is you're going to allow the devil to steal that dream from you. Yeah. He said, if you're ashamed to do it, you, just won't, you won't even dream about it. Yeah. And, he, and he wasn't telling me to turn around. I would have just turned around, went back and looked if that was the point, but it wasn't. He wasn't trying to get me to go back and do that. He was trying to get me to see... How many things in my life, he was asking me a question or wanting me to pose that question to myself. How many things in my life do I not even consider or look at 
that I let shame steal from me. And, and he said, what about the other people in your life that need the things that you're going to produce at, by doing your assignment? You're going to allow shame to steal it from them too. And I'm like, I didn't like that. I, I just couldn't have that. So I thought uh, this scripture, I, this is uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, if you'll go there. Hebrews 12, 1. And, and, and here's something about shame. Shame puts off a frequency. You know, a lot of people say, well, I'm just not going to believe anything I don't see. And I was thinking about this. If you fill this room up with, you know, used to we had radios, you know, they actually a little thing that sat on the shelf. <laughs> now the radio's here, you know. We, but, but just imagine if you fill this room up with radios, AM, FM, uh, XM, you know, all the, all the satellite, all those radios, if you fill them up, cut the power off, fill them up, set them to a different channel, plugged them in, and all of a sudden you had them all these different, let's say there's a thousand of them, and you set them at all these different channels, and you went over to the power box out here and flipped the switch on, every one of those radios would pick up a frequency that's running through this room right now. I don't get that, but I have to believe it because I would hear the radio playing. So I, I'm going to go back on the other side of that and say, well, I just have to believe they're going through here now. Well, here's the deal about Guilt, shame, confidence, the roar, the, the play that, that first one, the meow. That's what God hears when the devil roars. <laughs> now, I'm going to warn you, he's going to play a roar. I don't want you to jump out of your skin. I don't want to wake anybody up. But play what the devil hears when you talk. Do you know what you just felt? A frequency went through your body. Come on. That was the roar. And so when, when guilt and shame runs your life, that's the frequency you put out. You ever been to a place, you're in with a few people, and someone comes in, somebody comes in, it doesn't take but just a minute to tell if they're happy or not. It take, they don't have to say anything. They don't have to come in hollering and screaming and slinging stuff. You pick up their mood. You just picked up the frequency that they were emitting, right? So there's a frequency of faith. There's a frequency of doubt. And it, 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 it does what it does. So, and that's the way you're designed. But I want you to remember, that the main thing on this is God is not disappointed in you He's, he has never been disappointed in you, and He will never be disappointed in you. Jesus is not disappointed, okay? If you leave here, I want you to leave here knowing, I may have done this, I may have seen that, but, but I just don't want anybody to, to leave here thinking that Jesus has anything but love and care for them. And I just kind of look at it like this. I can't look at what He did on the cross and think, I wonder what He thinks about me. <laughs> right? There's no question about that. Uh, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 says, Therefore we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that which so easily ensnares or besets us, and let us run with endurance. That's what Mary's talking about. Run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before Him endured the cross. Now this right here is what I want to focus on just for a second. My Bible here says despising the shame. Yeah. Now every time I ever read that up until a couple, you know, a week or so ago, I thought, well, yeah, I mean, if, if you were put to shame on the cross, you would be, you would have to at least look at that and, 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 and despise that shame. But that's not what that word means. That word means to disesteem it's translated despise, but it's really the true translation is to disesteem, to dis, to nullify, and to make nothing of. Yeah. Jesus got on the cross. Now, there's a, I'll give you a movie reference because I, I do that. Star Wars, I'm not a huge Star Wars buff or anything like that. But the last one that I saw was apparently the last one they made where Luke, Leia, Han, all of them come back. They're old now. They're going through, you know, they're, they're doing the their thing, but Luke Skywalker, 
They're, the scene is they're in this cave. All the resistance is in this cave. All the, uh, the uh, what's the empire? Uh, the empire's outside with all the uh, guns, all the ships, all the, they brought back the old, uh, from the first Star Wars, they got those big things that walk, you know, in the desert and all that. They're all lined up, the whole deal. And there's just this little group inside this cave, the resistance. And basically, uh, Kylo Ren, which is actually Han and Leia's son, he's gone to the dark side. He's r- driving the force outside. So, He's telling them to, to, they're going to blast this cave. Well, inside the cave, Luke, Luke Skywalker, he's not there at the time. But then he also, he's, he's in the cave and he walks out. And he walks out of the cave and stands like halfway between the cave and the, uh, the uh, empire. So Kylo Ren goes nuts and says, I want every gun pointed at that guy. So they do. They start shooting and they blow a crater in the ground where Luke Skywalker is supposed to be. Well, they do that for a long time. It just, they make a huge deal about how many bullets they put at this one spot. Okay, they stop. The dust clears and Luke Skywalker walks out like this. He looks at him and goes, That's what Jesus did with your shame. On the cross, He went, (laughs) that's it? So now we walk off out of being, when we get born again, we don't have to be ashamed. It is gone. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Well, I just wanted to add that. and I'm, I'm good. Praise God. Glory to God.